academic freedom is surprisingly recent as a guiding force in the academic community. As recently as half century ago, there were, for example, the kinds of pressures in the McCarthy era. A hundred or more senior tenured faculty were dismissed, many of them summarily, during the McCarthy era. In the post-9-11 era, things have been much better, and I'm happy to recall that the academic freedom of most of my faculty colleagues has been much better protected in the post-9-11 era than was the case a half century or more ago. But there are still challenges, there are still opportunities, but historically, uh, academic freedom is something that really did not occur widely, was not widely recognized until, let's say, the 1930s or even the time of World War II. What's changed in the last half century or so is two kinds of forces. One, there are now organizations, such as the American Association of University Professors, the American Civil Liberties Union, and a host of other protective organizations that simply weren't there a century or so ago. Second, I think institutions and their governing boards have sought a kind of balance that simply wasn't there, or at least people didn't care that much about it. But today, governing boards are, for the most part, heavily committed to a balance between protecting free expression and free inquiry of faculty professors on the one hand and managing the institution's obvious needs and protecting the role and relationship of the institution within the larger community. That's something relatively recent, but the board commitment that I've seen in so many institutions within the last, say, quarter century is quite striking and I think has produced a quite benign change from what was there, say, a half century ago. The fundamental reason for protecting academic freedom is that without academic freedom for a teacher to teach and a scholar to pursue research, basically none of us is safe. Certainly the larger communities in which we all serve and uh, pursue various goals, none of those values is really safe without the protection of academic freedom for the scholar to teach and to pursue research. So it's simply a, uh, an essential core condition of institutional autonomy and institutional liberty that protects not just the scholar or the teacher, but protects everybody else. And that's why it's so important to have board leadership in establishing and protecting academic freedom. A governing board has both the opportunity and, in my view, the obligation to establish very clear policies, mainly for faculty and administrators, but sometimes even for students, because students may not have academic freedom in the same sense that teachers and scholars do, but it's important for students to know what those policies are and to understand that academic freedom protects their interests quite as much as the interests of their teachers and the scholars with whom they have classes. So I think with that uh, broader sense of responsibility, what the board needs to do is to establish very clear 
and sometimes fairly detailed policies that protect not simply the right to speak freely, sometimes even to speak outrageously, because that's covered by academic freedom as well, but also to pursue research in whatever area or field a scholar chooses to pursue research. Those are all part of academic freedom. Those are all parts of what needs to be protected. There's a final element, and that is to assure fairness or due process in every personnel decision. So if a faculty member is charged with some wrongdoing, however serious, it's crucial that there be a full dress hearing and I would say in the event of a, an actual outright dismissal or termination or firing, the case needs to go and to be reviewed by the full board. That's a major obligation. But without that kind of due process, I don't think we can have full, genuine academic freedom. It's not just in print or in the spoken word, say in a lecture, that academic freedom now protects inquiry and thought. Increasingly, it applies to other media. Indeed, for many years, the, uh, it was only books and magazines, really, that were uh, protected under the First Amendment. Then, happily, about 20 years ago, along came the Internet. And to the amazement of many observers, the United States Supreme Court conferred full, unequivocal protection on the Internet. That's now being extended to social media as well, so that it's important to recognize that it's not just the spoken word or the printed word that deserves protection, but the digital material, electronic material expression quite as much. <laughs>